Hello. All right. Looks like I I have to draw the circle. God. It's harder than you think. All right, so I'm going from the point uh, one zero, right, to the point negative one zero, right, which is here, and then from that point to the point negative two three. So here's negative two, and then three. Shit, I'm off my graph, right? Up here, here's three, here's two, here's one. So I need to go up to there. So how do you think we should do this? C is that curve. Well, it's actually kind of two curves, isn't it? Yes? So I'm going to break up C into two pieces, C1 and C2. So what I'm going to need to do is is this this integral I'm being asked to find, I'm going to have to do it over C1 and then over C2. Yes. Negative 2 from negative 1, 0 to negative 2. This is negative 2, right? And 3 is up here. So that's the point negative 2, 3 right there. All right, so because I've got to break it up over two curves, I need to find parametric equations for each of those curves. So let's talk about C1 first. C1, have we done enough of circles already to be comfortable with C1? All right, x is uh, co uh, cosine t. Y is sine t. dx dt is negative sine t. dy dt is cosine t and therefore ds since we've done it enough can i just say ds is one or just dt okay by the way what's the restriction on our parameter t here zero to pi right that should allow me to set up my first integral right y'all with me now Keep in mind also, in the original integral, I'm doing the integral with res the line integral with respect to x and y, right? So I'm actually not going to use ds, right? I just put ds here, right? Actually, I'm not going to need it. But it's just kind of more of a force of habit here that when I go through the parameter parametrizing the every, every all the different curves, I just do derivatives and then try and find ds. It's just like my natural sort of flow of things. All right, can we do the same thing for C2? C2. How are you going to get C2? Well, C2 is, is a line segment, isn't it? And we talked about how to find the parametric equations, right? What we did was we found the vector equation of the line, and then we changed the vector equation into its parametric equation. So depending on how comfortable you are with this now, I'm just going to write my, my vector equation. Is my starting vector plus t times my direction vector? What's my starting vector? Negative 1, 0, and my direction vector is the vector connecting those two. So the vector from this point to this point, which is negative 1, 3. And therefore, R of t looks like this, negative 1 minus t, uh, 3t. Agreed? And now t between 0 and 1. Now, But I'm also going to do it this way before I say it. I'm going to switch it. x is then negative 1 minus t, y is then 3t. 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 1. All right. Questions? We need some derivatives here. dx dt is negative dt, right? 
It's negative 1, or sorry, no, negative 1. Sorry, the dt is on the other side. Negative 1. What's dy dt? 3. And I don't need ds, right? So there's everything I need about C2. We haven't talked too much about this, but let's just let's kind of notice something real quick. On C1, if t goes from 0 to pi, I go from this, the point 1, 0 to the point negative 1, 0, right? So you could almost associate with this an orientation, right, a, a direction of movement. And then on the other one, it's this way also, right? From here to here, from here to here. Question would be, does it matter which direction you go? Do you get the same answer? Hmm. We'll answer that. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about it. Or even even better yet, what if what if I go what if I want to go from from this point here to this point here? I go over the half circle like that. What if I chose some other path? Does it give me the same answer? Well, think about it. it's the area of the curve, I mean the area of the curtain, right? So should you get the same answer or not? Well, the arc length of those two curves is different, right? So it would make sense that maybe it wouldn't. Now, changing directions, maybe that changes the sign. These are questions we're going to ask ourselves. I just want you to start thinking right now about direction, too. All right, let's do this integral. I'm trying to do the line integral over C of sine x dx plus cosine y dy. right, which is now going to become the line integral over C1 of sine x dx plus cosine y dy plus the line integral over C2 of sine x dx plus cosine y dy. All right, now this becomes, well, whenever we have this notation, this really means I'm going to do this one with respect to x plus this one separately with respect to y. So I'm going to write that down also. Line integral over C1 of sine x dx plus line integral over C1 cosine y dy. Then the other one, same thing. Line integral over C2 sine x dx plus line integral over C2 cosine y dy. These don't add up, right? I don't do sine x dx plus another integral sine x dx and get two sine x dx. No, because we're integrating over different curves, right? Now, if these were both C1s, then yes, you could put them together, but they're not. All right, now by definition, by definition, one more. The line integral over some curve C of some function dx means I have to first put the parameters for x and y into the function and then multiply by the derivative of x with respect to t dt. Now what about a and b? Those are my restrictions on t. All right, so this first one, remember, your first one you're on C1, so we're using all the information about C1. This becomes integral from, now on C1, what was the restriction on T? Zero to pi. Okay, sine of X. Well, what's X on C1? It's sine T. So this is sine of sine T, isn't it? Oh, it was cosine T? Sorry. Cosine T. Apologies. 
So that's sine of x. And what's dx? Negative sine t dt. So that oh, is this integral right here. Should we write them all out first and then go try and get them? Plus, okay, now I'm still on C1, right? I'm still on C1. So I'm going to go still 0 to pi cosine y. So that's cosine of sine t dy, which is cosine t, then d. T. The things that people miss, leave out, right? They forget to put the dx here is actually, you know, not just dt. Here it's negative sine t dt. Over here it's cosine t dt. That's the first two integrals. Now, the, the um, third one, integral over c2. Now, c2 is a different curve, so I go here from 0 to 1, right? Sine of x. What's x on C2? Negative 1 minus t. Yes? What's dx? Negative dt or negative 1 dt. Last one. Plus, I'm going to put it down here. Integral from 0 to 1 again, because I'm on C2. Cosine of y. That's cosine of y, but y was 3t times the derivative of y with respect to t, or, or derivative with y of y, which is 3 dt. Okay, all of these integrals can now be done by hand, which we won't do. I think we'll have Mathematica do it for us. But how would you do this first one? U substitution. U is cosine. There's the derivative, right? So it's going to be uh, antiderivative of sine of u, so negative cosine of u, and then do your substitution. Same thing here, right? This one, these are both linear functions inside of a trig function, so those are pretty easy to do also, just basic U substitutions. Let's see if we can do it all at one time using Mathematica. All right, here we go. Because I, I want you to at least have an answer for this. All right, here we go. The first one was 0 to pi. And let's see, it was x, right? So cosine, tell me if I'm wrong. Cosine of, no, no, it was sine of cosine of t times negative sine t dt. Zero. Paste. OK, next one. The only difference is it was cosine of sine t and then cosine t dt. Zero. Next was zero to one. Sine of negative one minus t negative 1 dt, which is cosine 1 minus cosine 2. That's in radians, not in degrees, all right? So that's some numerical answer. Copy, paste, uh, sine, what is it, 3t? Oh, wait, wait, hold on a second. It's cosine, right? Cosine 3t and then 3 here. Sine 3. 
1.907 or 1. Point, yeah, 1.09757. What do you think about those those first two being zero? Well, area under a curtain, right? Did we ever have areas under curves be zero? Yeah. I mean, we had that back in Cal 2 in the very beginning. Maybe even saw it in Cal 1, right? Where you'd have, like, let's just say you have sine x, right? Find the area under that curve from 0 to 2 pi. Zero, right? So we might have some area on top and on the bottom. That's all dependent upon the function you're integrating. Okay, so the, the, really the whole idea behind this problem is just make sure you, you get the order and the way you do things down, right? You have to find the parametric equations for the different curves, right? Split your curve up, get your restrictions, take your derivatives, organize your integral, split it up, organize, plug in, evaluate. Questions? Weird? All right, so now let's talk about... Like we said, orientation of path. What happens if we change the orientation of path? So let's say I have a curve. I say C here is the curve that goes from A to B, right? And then the other one I will call negative C is the one that goes backwards from B to A. What happens if we go backwards? Well, here's what happens. So now C and negative C have meaning to us, right? Negative C doesn't mean, oh, you make it negative. It means you go backwards the other direction, all right? So if you want to find the line integral of C over C of some function with respect to X, then if you go backwards the other direction, you get the same answer you just got, except it'll be negative. If you do it for Y, same thing. You go backwards, it'll be negative. But if you do it with respect to arc length, ds, you do not get negative. The, it does not matter which, which way you go. And that just happens to do with the fact that when you have arc length, remember arc length was square root of sum of the two derivatives squared? It's impossible for that to be, ever be negative. Here, with these two, that dx and that dy could be negative sometimes. So it could switch your sign. All right, path independence. This is going to become really big later on in this chapter. Given two points A and B, what happens if we choose two different points or two different paths connecting them? Does that change the value of the path integral? So here I have two points, A and B. I have two different ways of getting from A to B. I have go about that red curve right there on the right. We will call that path C. If we go the other way, straight line segment connecting them, we will call that <clears throat> C tilde with a little tilde over it. Does changing the path, even though we go from the same two points, does it give us the same line integral? <clears throat> okay, see if you can set that one up. All right, so we are going to we're going to take a look at the arc of the parabola x equals 4 minus y squared from the point negative 5 negative 3 to the point 0 2. I'm going to call that c1. Okay? And then we have c2. Oh no, no, sorry. Let's just call this C. The other one will be C tilde. Because notice we're not, what we're doing is we're going from one point to another, and we're doing two different paths, and we're comparing to see if the answers are different or not, right? So let's, let's get our head around what this thing looks like. We have a parabola. It's actually a parabola in the variable Y, so it's going to open up sideways instead of up and down. Uh, we could just plug in some points, like if Y is 0, what's X? Four. All right. What are the 
y-intercepts of this. So set x equal to 0. You get negative 2 and 2 on the y-axis, right? And we know this is supposed to pass through the point 0, 2, which is here. And it's also supposed to go through the point negative 5, positive 3. I'm sorry, negative 5, negative 3. 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 3 is down here. And notice I also said we're going, right, from this point to this point. So we want to go up like this. Oh, I missed it. Come through. Come back down. Whenever I miss them, I just make them bigger. That's all. Okay, so that's my parabola. That's it right there. Okay? And we're going in this direction. I have to sneeze. Okay. All right. So let's try and come up with our parametric equations, x and y. Now, if you think back to when I was showing you how you could use parametric plot on your calculator. If you have the equation solved where it's y equals a function of x, on your calculator you let x be t and you let y be whatever the function is. This is backwards. x is a function of y. So I'm going to let y be t. And now x is a function of y, but y is t, right? So it's 4 minus t squared. Does everyone see that? 4 minus t squared is 4 minus y squared if y is t. Now, what's the restriction on t? Well, t is the y-coordinate, isn't it? And I'm going to go from here up to here. What's the y-coordinate here? Negative 3, and what's the y-coordinate there? 2. So my t needs to go from negative 3 to 2. And check it for yourself. If t is negative 3, where are we? Plug in negative 3. Your x is going to be 4 minus 9. 4 minus 9 is negative 5. And then t is negative 3 here. You get, you get 5, negative 5, negative 3, which puts you here. What if, uh, what if t is negative 2? Just picking another point here. t is negative 2, that's 0. And this is negative 2, which puts you here. Make sense? If uh, if t is 0, right, then you're at 0, and then up here, 0, x is 4, so you're at um, this x-intercept. And then you move your way around the parabola. Make sense? Now, I need dx dt. Am I integrating with respect to arc length on this problem? No, I'm not. I'm doing dx dy, so I don't need ds. I'm going to keep that in mind. So uh, what's dx dt? Negative 2t. What is dy dt? Just dt, right? Or just 1. I'll bring the dt over later. So that's what's happening on this curve. So let's set up this integral. I'm trying to do the line integral over c of x sorry, no, y dx plus x dy, which is the same as the line integral over c of y squared dx plus line integral over c of x dy. So I just split it up into two. What is the restrictions on my integral now as I switch it over. Negative 3 to 2. y squared is t squared. dx, that's going to become your x prime, right? Your dx dt. So negative 2t dt. Do you all follow that? plus integral negative 3 to 2. What's x? 4 minus t squared. 
and then dy, but dy for us is going to be the 1 dt, right? So just dt. And those should be pretty easy to integrate. Let's see, I'm doing integral negative 3 to 2 of negative 2t cubed dt. What's the antiderivative there? <clears throat> negative 1 half t to the fourth evaluate a negative 3 <clears throat> to 2. What about the other one over here? That's just 4t minus 1 third t cubed evaluated negative 3 to 2. See if we can get a numerical answer here. Do you all follow all this? What do we get when we plug in 2 here? Sixteen, but then divided by two, but negative, so we get what? Negative eight, and then we subtract from that what we get when we plug in negative three. So negative three to the fourth power is 81, 81 over two, but negative, so negative 81 over two. You follow that? Then do the other one. Plus, let's see, what happens when we plug in 2? Get 8 minus 8 thirds minus negative 12 plus, what is that, 9? All of this should come out to 245 over 6. You get common denominator, things cancel. Okay, so what we did is we, we found the line integral over that one path. Now what we'd like to do is we'd like to compare it to just the line segment connecting those two and see if we get the same result. Should we? I don't know, right? You know, maybe. So now our new C, right, is going to be just the line segment connecting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, connecting this point to 1, 2, to this point here, the line segment going there to there. from negative 5, negative 3 to the point 0, 2. So R of T will be the starting point written as a vector, so negative 5, negative 3, plus T times the direction vector. What's my direction vector? By 5, which gives us negative 5, plus 5t, negative 3 plus 5t, which means that x is negative 5 plus 5t, and y is equal to negative 3 plus 5t. What's t going to vary from? 0 to 1. It's always 0 to 1, right? I said as long as you're going from one point to the other point, and you start, that initial vector is always the starting point written as a vector, and the direction vector is always the vector from your initial point to your ending point, then 0 to 1 will always work. All right, dx dt, 5, dy dt, 5 again. That's all we need, right? So the integral, line integral of y squared dx plus, I'm going to go ahead and break it up now, line integral of x dy on this new curve, or on the, it's a line segment, but we'll call it a curve, is going to be, it's x dy, oh yeah, thank you very much, x dy, not x squared. 
It's what? Well, I'm, I'm calling them both C. If you want, we can call this C tilde. You want to call that C tilde? I just don't want to put C2 because we've been saying C1 and C2 when we're trying to find, find it over some C and we break it up into multiple paths. Here, it's two different paths going from one point to the next. Does it equal the same thing or not? So it's a different sort of question. You understand? Okay. Uh, so C tilde is what we're calling it. Uh, what's Y squared? So we go 0 to 1, right? Y squared is the negative 3 plus 5T, right, squared. What's DX? 5 DT plus integral 0 to 1 again. X this time, which is, was it negative 5? Negative 5 plus 5T. And then DY, but DY for us is 5 DT again. And if you do this, which I'm not going to do, I believe you get negative 5 sixths. Any questions on where anything on that setup came from? This is, this is a question mark. I'll have to go back and check. All I can tell you for sure is that they're not the same, okay? You got that also? Yeah. Okay. So then hopefully my notes say something now. <laughs> there we go. So given two points A and B, what happens if we choose two different paths connecting them? Does it change the value of the integral? In general, the line integral depends on the path, right? In general. If we change the path, it is likely to change the path integral it is likely the path integral will change. There are some conditions which make the value of the line integral independent from the path chosen. That will be crucial later. It's called path independence. When we're trying to go from one point to the other, you go right now, if we're trying to do a line integral from one point to another, right now the path matters, right? We will figure out what does it take for it not to matter, and that will be called path independence. And then when we have path independence, things become very nice. Really, really nice. It's kind of like, uh, let me see if I can give you an analogy. We're looking a little bit ahead, but let me give you an analogy if I can in two-dimensional space. We know that If we have two points way back when, right, Cal 2, and if we want to find the integral of some function, right, dx, just say, from A to B, then it represented the area under that curve, right? Well, and, oh, yeah, and by the way, the answer to that is capital F of B minus capital F of A, right? Well, if we draw this, function like that, then it has a certain area under it, doesn't it? And if we draw it like this, it would have a different area, and they are not going to be the same, right? So you could almost say, in this case, it's not path independent, because the way I get from point that point on the left to the point on the right has an effect on the integral. Yes? It's still going to be the difference of the two endpoints, right? Do you see that? Capital F. What's the difference though? For the line for the line segment here, right? All I have to do is figure out what the antiderivative is, plug in B, plug in A, subtract. So this curve, the difference on the curve in the straight line is the capital F is different for each one, isn't it? But isn't there a way that I could draw a curve, possibly, maybe, where that green curve I just drew? actually has the same area as the line segment. It's going to be something like that. There's going to be something that if the function behaves a certain way, then all we have to do is evaluate the endpoints. And it's, it's going to be the fundamental theorem of calculus for line integrals. So, okay, but we're getting ahead. All right, now we go line integrals in space. Up to this point, 
what we've been doing is we've said, hey, we have a curve, right? And then that curves in two-dimensional space. We plug that curve into a function, and we find the area of the curtain, right? But what if your curve is in three-dimensional space, and you have a fourth dimension for your function? Then you no longer have an area of a curve, do you? Because you can't drop it down straight down onto the curve. You know what I'm saying? Because it's a fourth dimension, so where do you put it? But the concept is still the same. You can still define very clearly a curve in three-dimensional space. Instead of having two parametric equations, it has three, x of t, y of t, z of t. Your t is still bounded between two constants, a and b. Since Remember how we did the line, and the line we looked at is r of t, like the, the line segment? Well, we can do that for any curve. We can look at it as a vector function or a vector curve that draws this three-dimensional curve. Then the line integral of f along c, so this notation is exactly the same, except we've thrown a z in there, right? ds, though, is going to be different, because it's now a three-dimensional arc length which means you've got to go back to finding the arc length for a three-dimensional curve, which we did at some point. And it's basically the same thing we had before, square root, derivative squared, but now you have that third dz dt in there. And then this front part, f of x of t, y of t, z of t, that's taking your parameters and plugging them into that function. So like when we, we just, in the problem before, we replaced y squared, right? We replaced y with, uh, what was it? In the first time through c, it was t. In the second time, it was negative uh, 3 plus 5t. So that's just that part of it, plugging that stuff into the function. Now, this, this is kind of cool. We're going to have kind of a new notation now. Or instead of having this equals this, do you agree that plugging all the par parameters into our function is the same as basically evaluating the function, our scalar function f, evaluating it on the vector function r. This is weird. This is weird notation. You're plugging a vector function into a, a scalar function. That means you're taking each of the components of the vector function. x of t goes here, y of t, z of t. That goes into your function. Times, what is this? Well, that's the magnitude of the derivative of the vector function. What's the derivative of a vector function? What's the derivative of that vector function, r of t? Now, gradients are part, has partials. What, what's the gradient of a vector function? Y'all are trying too hard. The, if I give you a vector function, what's its derivative? The derivative is just a new vector function, r prime of t, which is equal to x prime of t, comma, y prime of t, comma, z prime of t, close off the vector. It's been too long. It's been too long. If I give you a vector function, r of t equals cosine t, sine t, t. Anybody know what that draws? Spiral going up, right? Okay, constant, like constant radius, right? So if I do that and I say, what's the derivative? All you do is component by component differentiation. But your answer is a vector function, right? It's another vector function. So if we go back and look at what this note is saying at the end, is that this part up here is just taking the vector function and evaluating your, your scalar function on that vector function. And this part right here is just the magnitude of the derivative. Go back here. If I say, what's the magnitude of this? What do you do? Square root of the sum of these squared, right? The sum of each one of those squared, which is why this formula, if I take the sum of each one of them squared, each one of these is the derivative of the components of the vector function. So that is the magnitude of r prime. Do you see that? All this notation, remember I handed you all that sheet? of formulas. Remember this? I do have an extra one of those. Anybody else need one of those? Right? 
I said, there's all this notation on here, right? We've done everything on the first page. We are now on the second page. Okay, so notice this is just a nice way of condensing this formula that's really ugly up here in big down to something that's a little more condensed, more tight, and easier to write. But same thing. Okay, and just like we said, we could take the line integral over uh, along a path, right, with respect to x or with respect to y. Well, now we can do it with respect to x or y or z because we have three variables. So what changes here? Here at the end, we have x prime t dt. Here, y prime t dt. Here, z prime t dt. Do you see how this is all just an extension of what we've already done? We've always done that, right? Always started in 2D and then pushed it out to 3D. All right, and as you might suspect, again, later on in this class, we will have to do a line integral over a curve of some, notice my letters here, this P of X, Y, Z means that's some function. Instead of using F, I'm using P. Then Q of X, Y, Z, D, Y, and then R of X, Y, Z, D, Z. If you want to do that, then you're going to wind up doing three separate integrals, one with respect to x, one with respect to y, one with respect to z. We've done this. We just never had to do that dz at that last one. All right. So let's see what we can do here. Find the line integral over c of x squared dx y plus y squared dy plus z squared dz, where c consists of the line segments from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 2, negative 1, and then from 1, 2, negative 1 to 3, 2, 0. So what do you think we're going to need to do with C? Split it into two different Cs, right? C1 and C2. Now, drawing them might be a little bit of an issue. Do you agree with that? We could do it. We could try 3D. But since it's already 221, I'm going to not draw them three-dimensionally. I'm just going to use my knowledge and your knowledge of line segments, right? And how we create vector equations for line segments, right? How do you do it? Initial point becomes your starting vector plus t times direction vector. Direction vector is what connects one point to the other. Okay. Let's do it. So let's do C1 first. C1 connects the points. Got to catch up with myself here. 0, 0, 0 to the point 1, 2, negative 1. And therefore, my vector function R of t will be equal to, well, 0, 0, 0 is nice, isn't it? Okay, and then the direction vector is just that. So isn't this just going to be t, 2t, negative t? And then I'm going to need its derivative. The derivative of this is the vector 1, 2, negative 1, isn't it? What's the magnitude of this vector? Square root of 6. So according to what we said a second ago, the line integral over C of x squared d y, uh, x plus y squared dy plus z squared dz should be equal to the line integral over C1. Can I just save all that junk again? That's that junk. Right, plus the integral over C2 of all that junk again. And all we're doing right now is this one, because we've only found the, the vector equation for C1 at this point, right? So let's, let's focus on that. The integral over C1 of all that junk 
is equal to the integral. Oh, my t. What's my t? I never said it. What's t between 0 and 1? So my integral goes from 0 to 1 of my function, look at my function, which is x squared, but x was t, right? Where am I getting that from? Right there. That's my x function right there. This is my y function, 2t. This is my z function. So I have x squared, so t squared dx. What's dx? Is just 1 dt. So we have just dt. Plus integral 0 to 1. Now I'm doing the y squared dy. So what was y? It was 2t squared it. 4t squared. What was dy? 2dt. Plus integral 0 to 1 z squared. So z was negative t. Square it. t squared. What was um, dz? It was negative t or negative 1 dt times negative 1 dt. Is it me or do the first and third integrals cancel? Isn't that integral from 0 to 1 of t squared dt? And isn't this one over here, if the negative comes out, minus integral from 0 to 1 t squared dt? I don't know if I worked through this. Did I work through this? I don't think I noticed that. If I did, I don't think I noticed that. No, I didn't work through it. Never mind. Yeah, keep that negative there, right? Any question on where that came from? Any of that? Okay, that's going to be what? 8 thirds t cubed evaluated from 0 to 1. That's just 8 thirds. That's only the line integral over C1. Now we need the line integral over C2, which means we have to find the parametric or vector equation for C2. So let me look at, let me work on C2 now. What about C2? Well, R of T, I'm going from 1 to negative 1. So I'm going to say 1, 2, negative 1 to the other point, 3, 2, 0. So what's my direction vector? 2, 0, 2, 0, 1. So therefore, my R of t is 1 plus 2t, two, 2, and negative 1 plus t. Now I can get my derivative, which is 2, 0, one. Now, do I really need the magnitude? I don't, do I? But I'll put it here anyway. What is it, 5? When would I need that magnitude? Yeah, go back to our notes. Remember I said that there were, there were three types. So you go dx, right, dy, dz. But the note before this says, if you just want to integrate along ds, right, go with respect to arc length, then at the end here, you'll be using the r prime of t, the magnitude, which we're not. And I'm not, obviously, I'm not showing you an example of one of those either. All right, can we set this one up quickly? The line integral over C2 of all that junk, right? is equal to integral from 0 to 1 again, x squared. I've got to go back. What was x here? 1 plus 2t. So 1 plus 2t squared. 
dx to dt plus integral from 0 to 1 of y squared, which is just 2 squared, right? Which is 4 times 0 dt, which means that integral is gone. Plus integral 0 to 1 of my, y, my z squared. z was negative 1 plus t. And then negative, right? Oh, no, no, sorry. It's not negative. It's just dt. And now we figure out what this is. So that's gone. Yeah, whatever that is, it is. Okay? Anyone get it yet? You got 9? We'll go with 9. And then you have to add that to the previous answer, which was 8 thirds. And that's your result. Okay. It's perfect. I have 10 minutes to introduce the next idea. We're still in 8.3. Or no, 38.3. <laughs> Wrong semester. Um, we, are, we, we are in 13.2 still, and we will be in 13.2 next time for a little bit. And we'll just probably start 13.3 in the class on Wednesday. Um, Okay, up to this point, we've been integrating scalar functions, right? We've had f, f of x, y, or f of x, y, z. We've been integrating them either with respect to arc length or with respect to x or respect to y or with respect to z. Now, we br finally bring in the vector fields that we had just barely talked about in 13.1. So... In 10.3, we defined, or maybe in some physics class, you defined work to be force dotted with the displacement vector. So work equals the, the dot product of the force vector and the displacement vector. So let's say that we have – I don't remember how I did this. Let's say that I'm, well, let me move this back down so it'll look more logical. There. So let's say I'm trying to drag this table from here to here, right? So I pull it. Let me make sure I'm not going to pull it. So I start pulling. I'm applying a force, right, at a certain angle, and I'm pulling this thing across, right, like this. Okay, the green is how far I go, the displacement vector, and the direction. Well, but I'm pulling it horizontally, so that's why it's pointed this way. The red is how hard I'm pulling, right, to move it. So the, the red is my force vector. The longer the force vector, the more force, right? And the green is a displacement vector, which gives us the direction and distance we move. If we dot product these, that will give us the work. Okay? Y'all all right with that? There's a dot. Remember, dot product is a number? Cross product is a vector, right? Now, what happens if the steeper this angle, right, the more force, the more shallow this angle, the less force is required to move it against friction. But that's it's kind of a different, we're not really talking about that, I guess. Okay, so work is the force vector dotted with the displacement vector. Sure there's no questions? Now imagine a point moving along a curve C within a vector field. If S is a force field, like electromagnetic field or gravitational field, then the total work done by the field is the sum of the work done at each point. Do I have a visual? I do. All right, I'm going to see if this will work. I'm going to take this out. Don't recall what this does. I thought I wanted 
Oh, there it is. I was like, which one of these moves this damn thing around? Okay, so let's say I'm, I've got a point. Let's just start it out over here. And I want to move it across that parabola like that, right? So I'm starting here. I want to move it up and then back down like that. And I tell you that there is a vector field, a vector field in this space. So think of it as an electromagnetic field, gravitation, something like that. So moving the point, I'm not moving it against friction or anything. I'm just moving it against some, some field. The field is telling me what it wants to do with that point, move it in a certain direction. So as you can see, when I'm down here, or let's move over here. When I'm over here, this red vector, okay, is the, is the field, the vector field. It's what all these little blue vectors are wanting to do, right? If I move this point further up here, what's going to happen to that red? If I move it further up on this parabola, it's going to get smaller and looks like it's going to get more vertical. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's moving too much. Hold on. There we go. Yeah, you can kind of see here that it's pointed this way because see the blue is pointed that way? All right, let me move this guy over a little bit more. My computer is really having trouble right now. Yeah, I, th I think that's what I'm going to do. Let's see if that moves a little better. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Now, the green vector is capital T. You remember what capital T is? the unit tangent vector. It's your derivative of your, of your curve, right? The derivative of the curve gave you a direction that was tangent to your curve, but then we, then we make it a unit vector, which means it's the derivative. Do you all remember what capital T is? There you go. Capital T, capital T of T is the derivative of your vector function divided by its own length. So that green tells you which way you're pointing as you're moving along the curve, right? I want you to look at that green then as being your displacement. Now, that's going to seem weird because your displacement is not one, is it? But just see if you, at least the displacement, the green is the direction in which you're going, right? Tangent right there, you're headed. Like if I move just infinitesimally, I will move in the direction of that green, won't I? The red is the force. We can see that the work done at each point is the force dotted with the tangent. So we have, there's a little bit of clarification we need here. Here's the dot, right? Here's the dot. DS is going to be like a scalar. Where's my pen? I'm going to, you know, I'll try and draw it up here. See if I can make this make sense. Here's my blue curve, right? Here's a point. The tangent vector is moving somewhere over here, right? My unit tangent vector. Let's say my force, just for the sake of, of argument here and just showing you, let's say my force is like that. Okay, that's what the field is doing. Then in the infinitesimal, right, in the very, if we cut this up into infinite number of pieces, so zooming in on that little infinitesimal piece, the work done at that point, that instantaneous point in time, will be the F dotted with, the tangent, but the tangent's too long, isn't it? But wouldn't, what if I scaled the tangent? Okay, so I'm going to zoom in on that piece. Here's my zoom in. Here's my dot, all exaggerated to hell here, right? Here's my, here's my unit tangent normal going off like that. My unit tangent is going like that. My, my force vector is coming out of the page this way, right? Big old thick force vector. My displacement is not one, right? But isn't it approximately, 
Isn't it approximately? I'm looking for a color, damn it. In the infinitesimal, wouldn't it be equal to that arc length right there? Like as far as how long it is. It's in the same direction as T, right? The green? It's the same direction as T, but I need to scale T back down so I can scale it by the arc length, can't I? If I scale t, because t is a unit vector, I scale it by ds, then it doesn't it have the same length as ds? But it's a vector, so it has that same direction. Which is why in the formula, this right here, ds, is your arc length. And what I want you to see is that that ds is actually a scalar attached to t, which means that you're getting that little green infinitesimal. Now, we separate it because scalars can be pulled out of dot products. Yeah, I'm, I guess what I'm saying is this. I, I want to actually do this. I want to go ds times t. Scalar multiples. A scalar multiple of a vector is a vector point in the same direction, just either shrinking it or stretching it, right? ds is infinitesimally small. So I'm, I'm actually scaling t by the infinitesimal length of that little um, arc length. So pull the ds to the outside and you have this. So what, I mean, this is like the major result here because what it's saying is R of T, right? R of T is, is the path of, that you're trying to go through, right? You're trying to go through some path in space. You have some field, at capital F. Then all you have to do to figure out the work done is take the line integral, right? Line integral over that path of F dotted with T. T we know is the unit tangent, right? F is a given vector field. It has to be given to us. And then ds, everything else, the, remember dot product should come out to not be a vector anymore. So you're going to start with the vector field, right? You're going to also have this, which is a vector function. You're going to dot them. That will give you a scalar function. And then what you'll be doing is a line integral over a scalar function with respect to arc length ds. So it'll be stuff we've done before. I won't do it because I'm out of time, but here's all the work that you would need to set this up. Um, and then a general definition. Here it is. And we'll do one of these next time. But yeah. Oh, wow. That's, we're not ready for that. All right. Um, I'll send out a homework assignment since we're out of time. Everyone have a wonderful, wonderful day.